So uh, this is a work that um, we all submitted to the main conference. And uh, what we did here in this work is to investigate the problem of regressing the angular velocity of an event camera with a spiking neural network. So I call it SNN from now on. So unlike conventional processing methods, a spiking neural network can process events asynchronously and can also run at very low power on dedicated neuromorphic hardware. So what you can see here, for example, we have an event camera. Um, we want the uh, angular velocity, so this is roll, pitch, and yaw. And we process all of this with a spiking neural network. So first I'm going to reiterate um, quickly um, the difference between a standard camera and an event camera. You probably already, most of you have seen it, who have li listened to the talks. So here you can see a rotating disk with a dot and the standard camera output and the DVS output, which we call the event camera. And you can see that uh, we have a sp spiral in space and time for the event camera. And there are no events when the disk is not rotating anymore. However, the standard camera still outputs frames. When we increase the rotating speed, of course, uh, the event camera can still uh, capture this information while the standard camera has motion blur. And this is due to the high temporal resolution of the event camera. And when you have the event camera in a room and you're not moving it, then you can only see the pixel that move. If you move the camera, you can essentially see the gradients in the scene. All right, so now what is the difference between an artificial neural network and a spiking neural network? Um, you can think of it as that artificial neural networks are um, using frame-based input, while a spiking neural network uses event-based input. Um, but the main difference in, is in fact how this information is processed. So conceptually, for for a neural network, a standard uh, artificial neural network, you have synchronous processing at low temporal resolution. So this means you need to pass the whole input and you have to wait until you output something. While for the spiking neural network, you can process events asynchronously uh, at high temporal resolution. So I'm going quickly uh, to explain, maybe most of you are not familiar with spiking neural networks. So here we use one of the um, popular models of spiking neurons, and this is a deterministic spiking neural network. So how does this work? You can see the axis, the U axis, which is the potential. So you can see this here. And you have the neuron threshold theta, where you can see it here. And we have a resting potential. So the resting potential is when there is nothing happening in the neuron, the potential is at this, uh, at this level. Now, uh, in spiking neurons, um, you can decrease the potential if an incoming spike uh, has a negative weight, the synaptic weight that is negative. You can also increase the potential if you have a positive synaptic weight. If multiple events uh, or spikes arrive at this neuron in short succession, you superimpose their effect. And once you reach the neuron threshold, you generate an output spike. So you can already see uh, that this is essentially an event-based processing um, uh, pipeline. And there is also a refractory response, which uh, basically ensures that you don't generate uh, an output spike immediately afterwards. So here's a, a visualization of a multi-layer perceptron spiking neural network. In the left, you have the input that are events. Then you process them in parallel, and on the right, you have uh, spikes that are outputted from the spike neural network. Uh, what you can see immediately is the difference is that instead of processing layer by layer, layer in a hierarch hierarchical way, the spike neural network does everything in parallel on all the layers simultaneously. So it's basically parallel in space and time. And this is the one important factor because it means that you can uh, basically have lower latency and you can directly benefit from the event-based input. So if you, uh, any one of you have questions, uh, please ask if it's not clear. All right, in the chat or okay. Slack channel. Okay, good. So uh, now back to the original uh, question that we were asking ourselves. Um, we want to learn the angular velocity of, uh, so we have as inputs, we have events, and we want to learn the angular velocity, and we need to formalize this problem first. 
So uh, if you look at this problem, it's essentially a sequence to sequence problem. And this means that the input sequence are events from an event camera. Okay, so the resolution that we chose is 240 by 180, which is one of the Davis 240C resolutions. Um, the output sequence is a continuous signal in R3. So you want to get pitch, uh, roll, um, uh, and tilt at the same time. And we also have a causality constraint. So this is important because we only know about the present and the past. And this is, of course, like the standard setting in robotics where we don't have, uh, we don't have access to the future to make predictions in real time. And so how, how did we do this? So basically, um, we generate a huge synthetic data set for a controlled experiment. So we downloaded 10,000 different uh, panoramic images from, uh, from the internet. And we simulated with eSIM, so the event simulator, uh, one and a half hours of rotating um, event cameras in these panoramic scenes. You can see this on the right. Uh, to generate accurate ground truth data, which is important to, to understand if this works or it does not. And how does this look like essentially? So in the left, you can see the input events that, uh, that it are fed to the um, spike in your network. Um, you can see it's kind of messy and it's difficult to interpret, um, but this is uh, the event-based uh, world, how it looks like. You can see already it's 100 milliseconds on the left and also 100 milliseconds on the right, because on the right, you can see the predictions. So tilt, pan and roll are the different axes, blue, green and red. And you can see the ground truth uh, as dashed and uh, solid the, the prediction. And you can see that at approximately 50 milliseconds, the spiking networks more or less predicts um, the angular velocity simultaneously for all the axes. And it's essentially 50 milliseconds because um, that's what we define the network to do. So we basically have a loss function. You can see this here. And this loss function penalizes the deviation from the ground truth. And it is actually applied after 50 milliseconds because we want to have some uh, initial um, a settling time for the spike neural network because it starts from zero. It doesn't know anything um, before. And in top, you can quickly see that we have a convolutional spike neural network with essentially six layers. Um, if you want to know in more detail, you can check, check out the paper. Uh, so far, any questions? Um, maybe I don't have the chat open, but if, if there are any, please let me know. I think that's all far. Okay, good. So, uh, so what we did, we wanted to know uh, do spike neural networks, uh, the current state of the art methods, work well against artificial neural networks? So, we trained on this data set multiple different uh, data, um, artificial networks as well. So, in blue, you can see spike neural network six, which means it's a six layer spike neural network. Um, and ANN six means there's a six layer artificial neural network. And you can see that the median relative error, uh, which tells you how accurate your predictions are, or different angular velocities. And you can see that the spike neural network is almost as good as the ANN6, means the same architecture or a very similar architecture for an artificial network. And we could train it uh, almost as well as you would uh, be able to train an artificial neural network. And now I have to make it, uh, I have to make it clear that the spiking neural network does event-based computation at high temporal resolution, while the ANN does uh, low temporal uh, predictions at every 20 milliseconds um, and doesn't do continuous prediction. So it's not, it's not quite apple to apple, but uh, I would say close enough. And we also trained deeper networks, so actually 50 layer ResNet from scratch on this data set. You can, for example, see the red curve and what you see is that um, immediately that more powerful networks, of course, also perform better. And due to the computational constraints that we had at this project at the beginning, we couldn't perform exactly the same experiment for the SNN. So we would also expect that it would perform better. But this is, uh, I would say, an open question still. There's one question that maybe one can uh, ask now. Sure. So how do you read out continuous volume from the spiking network? Mm -hmm. So uh, how it's done essentially at the output uh, of the spike networks are spikes, but they are convolved with, um, with a function that is uh, very similar to 
to how the the responses are in the in the potential of the spiking neuron. So you have a function that you essentially convolve um, with each spike, and you sum up. You have to superimpose this uh, this continuous values that you get, and you get a floating point value in the end, essentially in continuous time. Is this yeah. okay? So yeah, so quickly the summary. So uh, I think we have shown that SNNs can be competitive with ANNs on this on this task. That is, for me, it is quite an interesting task, the regression task, which is a bit different to what uh, also many people do. Uh, so many people do classification, and this is why we looked at regression, and we can say uh, SNNs can also be used for this uh, on on this task, and. Also, larger SNNs are likely to perform better. So larger means more parameters, um, essentially deeper networks. It's also possible that actually more shallow networks perform better because our architecture is, of course, not the best possible architecture. So we're not claiming that shallower networks are not performing better. Um, then I think high temporal resolution is crucial. That is something that we also saw in the previous plot. Um, either use events or you have to use a representation that preserves the temporal resolution. So like a voxel grid um, that has been used in the, in the community for some while. And maybe a quick outlook. So the discussion, I think uh, SNNs are really natively support event-based data, which is, which is great because um, yeah, it's kind of missing. If you use a deep artificial neural network on event-based data, you make some sacrifices like latency, uh, you use much more power to uh, to predict anything, and for SNNs you don't have these drawbacks. Uh, but also that training and design of SNNs is active research. So uh, I think there's a lot of research going on on how to train SNNs, how to make training also low power, uh, and to understand them better. So I think this will also improve in the future. And for me, really, uh, SNNs, they show the potential for efficient and low latency vision-based estimation, I think it's, uh, they have great potential in the robotics uh, uh, community. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. So there are uh, two other questions on the, on the chat, uh, well, actually three. So from Antonio, uh, I have two questions regarding your work. First, could this SNN-based methodology be extended to estimate not only the angular velocity, but also the angular pose of a moving robot. That's the first one. OK, so the angular pose, um, theoretically, you could integrate the angular velocity, and you would, you would get the, the pose um, if, you, if you want to do this. But there will be, um, so regressing the pose is not a very, I mean, it's not a very well posed problem, because the angular velocity can directly estimate it. However, the pose it will drift over time, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, if this answers the question. Yeah. Uh, next, does the estimation quality depend on the temporal discretization of the event-based camera? Um, I think the temporal, not of the event camera, because the event camera essentially has. Uh, I mean, of course, yes, also the event camera, but I think it's more of the spiking network. Mm -hmm. So, spiking network now are. Also on the low heat chip, they're basically discretized in one milliseconds if there are digital chips. And um, of course, if you would have high resolution, there would be potential to be more accurate. But I think this is not really the, the true, I mean, the, the limiting factor. Mm. Then we have two questions which sort of are from, come from different people, but they're related. So how do you train the weights of the uh, SNN using the loss, loss function, and then another one is how long does it take to train the SNN? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, it's a bit frozen, so here. Okay, uh, if you can see here, there's some optimization details. So we use sur surrogate gradient methods. They are uh, methods that approximate the gradients um, of the, uh, because the essentially the, the potential the output with respect to potential is not differentiable, so we use surrogate gradients, which make it possible. There are also other methods that are being investigated, so like looking at stochastic spiking networks, which make it differentiable. But this is, I would say, a research topic, so it, it can get better. And we also use automatic differentiation, so we're not using uh, STDP rules uh, for the multi-layer uh, approach. And the, the training time? 
Um, well, training time, I think for, for this data set, we train for like uh, one day, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, there is a question from Javier, uh, which I can link to another question, uh, like a personal question. Do SNNs in general have any drawback limitation currently? Are they ready to be applied with a nice performance? And sort of related to my question is actually, uh, I mean, my question would be, uh, when you simulate the spiking units, you have to integrate if I understand correctly, a differential equation for each uh, unit. So you are basically uh, kind of wasting, if you want, lots of um, lots of computation. Is is that correct? Um, so we don't do. So you can formulate um, the integration as a convolution in time, actually. Okay. Ah. So you don't have to do this. So we we are not using Euler integration or any integration ah. scheme. We're basically convol convolution mm -hmm. convolving. And, um, yeah. And it, in terms of the limitations and the performance? Yeah, I mean, this is a very open-ended question, of course. I mean, mm. from my point of view, uh, you have to understand, I mean, a spike neural network, you cannot just use a spike neural network for anything that is the same task as you would do with artificial neural networks. You have to see um, yeah, what you want to use it for. I think also training um, is more challenging. So I don't think it will, it's as easy as to train artificial neural network and you might not be able to do all the tasks that you want. So we picked in this case angular velocity regression because uh, we thought it is doable. Um, if you want to do something else, you have to try it first, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two more questions. Let's try to be uh, answer them, but see if we can do it quickly. So how is the comparison on using convolutional uh, resources between SNN and ANN? So like, are they heavier than standard networks or uh, you mean the, the, from a computation point of view yeah yeah exactly yeah. okay so in simulation yes because you you discretize in one millisecond so you have to you have this additional time dimension which makes it more demanding if you if you simulate it on a conventional hardware but if you use specialized neuromorphic hardware like the loi chip or even emulation of uh, spike neural networks they much uh, i mean they're very low power so mm -hmm. they they are much lower power yes Okay, then just the last one. Does the output depend on the environment behavior? For example, the output in a highly dynamic environment versus a static environment. The output of the network, I guess. Oh, I mean, okay, to answer it from for this specific task, uh, yes, I think it would matter. So in this case, we looked only at static environments. If you would have moving people uh, in the scene, I think you would have to, to add it to the training data set to, to make it uh, more robust. Mm 